Faith in the death. We're in Hebrews 11, the Hebrew Hall of Faith, and we're getting a better picture of what faith actually looks like in the flesh. We looked at the faith of Abel and how faith first and foremost shows up as a gift of God in the form of personal trust and reliance. Unlike his brother Cain, Abel offers a sacrifice of a living animal. Death is involved as a substitute and the confession of a need for a new beginning before, before good works can be acceptable. It was justification by faith alone. We looked at the faith of Enoch and how faith can cause one man against the world, contramundum, to have a massive impact on future generations. We saw how, by faith, Enoch pleased God. Enoch walked with God. We looked at the faith of Noah and how he, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Like his grandpa Enoch, he also walked with God in faith. Now we've been looking at the faith of Abraham, uh, the father of the faith. This is the third and final sermon on Abraham's faith. In the first one, we looked at Abraham's faith in the dark. In the second, or last Lord's Day, we looked at Abraham's faith in the delay. And today we're going to look at Abraham's faith in the death. In faith in the dark, we saw Abraham is the father of faith. He obeyed God and left everything he knew to go to an unknown place by faith alone. Faith and works, we saw, are not in opposition. Abraham was saved by faith alone, but his faith instantly led him to obey. It was a faith that got instantly to work. He illustrates faith that obeys without delay. He went to live in the promised land as a foreigner, lived in tents, he was homeless in the home he was promised. He looked forward to a heavenly city, illustrating the life of faith in the already, not yet. In the faith and the delay, last week we saw Abraham waited many, many years for God to fulfill his promise of a son. He demonstrated to us faith even when it's delayed. The promise is delayed and delayed and delayed. Abraham and Sarah tried to help God fulfilled the promise. They tried to do it their way. Hey, God, we got these good ideas, but God shut them down, kept them in a place that required patience and faith. Both Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead, it says, when it came to reproduction, but that didn't stop God. Abraham's faith was unshakable because God was unstoppable. So today I want to talk about the third way that Abraham's faith was tested, Faith in the death. But first, we're going, to have, we're going to have to skip a little bit of our text to where it talks again about Abraham. So it talks about Abraham those two times, and then it, it has another text in between, and then it talks about Abraham again. So we're going, to, we're going to skip that part of the text, and we'll get back to it when we're in chapter 12, because it ties into a, a text in chapter 12. But I do want to at least read it to you today and maybe say a few things about it. It's Hebrews 11, 13 through 16. It says this, These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles in the earth. For, peoples, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, we'll get back to that when we get into chapter 12 in a little more detail. That first statement, though, in verse 13 that I just read, seems to go against what we've been seeing in this chapter so far. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promise. What? I thought well, this is all about receiving the promises in spite of the difficulties if you hold on to the faith. There's a lot to say about this, but the one thing I will say that it means is that the promises were to them, but they were also beyond them. The promises to them were beyond just them. It wasn't just a personal promise to just them. God is not like Oprah, and he just like, you get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. That's not what happens. 
Remember, one of the things God said to Abraham back in Genesis 17, verse 8, he said, and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. It wasn't just about Abraham. It wasn't just about Abraham's son, Isaac. It was about future generations. It was about future generations. It was ultimately to be fulfilled in Jesus himself. Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Ultimately, the promises were about Jesus. The Jesus who the one, the letter is written to, were being tempted to abandon to go back to the old types and shadows. The promise was also not just about the promised land. It wasn't just about Canaan. But we see that we see that it was about Canaan. That was the promise. They were uh, promised the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey. But that was not all. We see that expanded in the New Testament as well. Now, this is the post-mill part of me. I have to point this part out at least. Romans 4.13, for the promise, Romans 4.13, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world. See, now it changes, not just heir of the promised land, heir of the world. Did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. He would be heir of the world. Well, that makes perfect sense because it was really about Jesus. And what does God the Father say to God the Son after laughing in mockery at the puny plans of the world conspirators? Psalm 2, verse 8 says, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions. Then what did Jesus say at the Great Commission? He said, It's happened. All authority in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. Go, therefore. Because of that, go and make disciples of all nations. So we'll come back to that when we're in chapter 12. So let's talk about faith and the death. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. The only way you could have faith in any kind of death is if you believed in resurrection right? Resurrection. Death brings with it a certain level of finality. It's kind of difficult to hold on to hope after someone dies. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We serve the Lord of resurrection life. We serve the Lord of resurrection life. Remember what Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. But resurrection is not a new concept in the Old Testament, or the New Testament. It's not new to the New Testament. We see a picture of it right away in the Garden of Eden, a type of of death when we uh, see the first wedding. Uh, God takes Adam, and it says he puts him into a deep sleep. Puts him into a deep sleep, a type of death. And he takes out his rib. You all know the story. And uh, he puts them back together, and he fashions Eve, his bride. He walks her down the aisle, gives her to Adam, and, uh, and the two become one flesh. So there's a death, there's a resurrection, and then there's a glorification. Listen to what it says in Job, Job 19, 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth, And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, 
whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another, my heart faints within me. Resurrection's all over the Old Testament. It comes in the form of story after story after story. We see it in the story of Joseph when he interpreted the chief baker's dream as meaning that in three days he will, he will be killed, three days he will be killed and hung on a tree. One of the morals to that story is don't ever dream about cake baskets. We see it in the story of Jonah when he is as good as dead, if not dead dead, in the belly of the fish for, once again, three days. Jesus made the Jonah connection very clear in Matthew 12, starting in verse 38, it says this, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to no, no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And we see resurrection in the story of Abraham and Isaac. I would, I would say that this, by far, was probably the biggest test of Abraham's faith. And this story makes us all a little bit uncomfortable, right? If we're going to be honest, this story is hard to hear. It's hard to read. Have you ever read the story of Abraham and Isaac to your kids in a children's Bible? It's just a little, it's, even, even then, it's a little weird. Even in a children's Bible version, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a hard story. I could see this story being a scary horror movie. This man is hearing voices in his head telling him to get a knife, get his son, go on a journey. But I think that's intentional. I believe that's absolutely intentional. The horror is divinely intentional. It's rated R for a reason. This was the hardest test of all. It was a horror story. That great modern day philosopher, Tom Bodet. Do you guys know who Tom Bodet is? Most of you younger people don't. He's, that, he's an author and a voiceover guy and a radio. He, he's a kind of a comedian. He, he's, he was famous for his Motel 6 commercials, where he said, I'm Tom Bodet, and we'll leave the light on for you. That great philosopher said this. <laughs> in the, he read it in the, this quote in the light of the Motel 6 lamp. He said, in school, you're taught a lesson and then given a test. In life... You're given a test that teaches you a lesson. That's pretty good. In school, you're taught a lesson, then given a test. In life, you're given a test that teaches you a lesson. This test that Abraham had to go through taught Abraham a lesson, but it also teaches all of us the greatest lesson about how God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. Or as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So let's go back and look at the story in Genesis 22. <clears throat> look at a little bit of the details. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1, says this. I'm just going to read it through and then we'll kind of go over a little bit of it. After I... Or after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood 
for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took it, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar, and the, he built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. <clears throat> and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of Yahweh, it shall be provided. So now I want to kind of go through that uh, and expound a little bit on some of the verses. Verse 1 again, after these things, God tested Abraham. He said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. Responds immediately. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. I mean, can you think of a, I'm, he, he, it's almost like he's pushing the point. He's like, take your son, yeah, your only son, Isaac. Well, he had Ishmael, but that was a little different. It wasn't part of the, the promised son of the covenant. So take your, your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Also, whom you love. You know that son you love so much? You have to imagine a, Isaac was probably a little spoiled, right? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. I mean, how old were they, right? When they finally got him, just think about that. I'm only 52, and I can see doing that. Okay. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So he tells him to go to the land of Moriah and offer up your son as an ascension, a burnt offering or an ascension offering. What, happened, what else happened at Moriah, the land of Moriah or Mount Moriah? There's other things that happen in the redemptive history at that place. For one, the story of David and Goliath. And I've talked about this before, but when David killed Goliath, he uh, cut his head off, took his head for a, a walk, and he took it to a mountain. And he, uh, and he put it at this mountain. And, and I truly believe that was Golgotha. That was Skull Mountain. Golgotha is, uh, comes from the phrase Goliath of Gath. David killed Goliath in the skull, in the, uh, where just as the son of David, Jesus himself would kill, would crush the skull of the serpent. So he, that's where that happened. That's where he took the skull. It's also Golgotha. It's where Jesus uh, was crucified. It's the same area where Jesus was crucified. And it was where, uh, it's where Solomon's temple was built. It's right where Solomon built his temple. 2 Corinthians 3.1 says, Then Solomon began to build the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where Yahweh had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So, so Solomon built the temple at this place, Moriah, because of something that happened with his father, David, at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. You guys know about the story of Ornan the Jebusite? 
Well, I'll try to briefly summarize the story. David uh, was told not to make a, take a census of the people, of his people, and he did so anyways. He took a census. He really uh, made a mistake there. Uh, and then God sends this prophet Gad to David. David was in serious trouble because of what he did. He wasn't supposed to do that because the census was relying on human strength instead of trusting in the providence and protection of God. And so God sends this prophet Gad to David, and he gives him three options. He says, okay, you're going to be punished for this. This is, this is going to happen. But you get three spanking sticks to choose from, right? You get three choices. You pick what punishment you want. Uh, the first one was, uh, was three years being uh, attacked by their enemies, three years of, being, uh, of his enemies getting, uh, attacking them and uh, coming against them, or three months, no, 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 it's three years of a plague, three years, you could have three years, or three years of a plague, you could have three months of your enemies coming in and attacking you, or you can have three days of pestilence that the sword of the Lord will come against you with. And so David said, uh, well, I guess I'll choose punishment from God. I'll choose him because he at least would sometimes shows mercy. And so he picked the three days of pestilence. And then God sent the angel of death, and 70,000 people were killed. And, uh, and this, this angel of death got almost to Jerusalem. He was going to destroy Jerusalem. And right outside of Jerusalem, God sees David repentant and remorseful and crying out for mercy. And so God decides to stop the angel he says, so stop, don't, don't do it. And uh, so where the angel stopped was at the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And that's where he, he stopped. And so God said, well, go make an altar and offer up sacrifices, and uh, we'll be, everything will be good. And so, so David goes to this Ornan. He told him to do it right there, make, make an altar at Ornan, the Jebusite's uh, threshing floor. So he goes to Ornan and says, hey, I need to make this altar. I would like to buy all the supplies, the animals, everything I need. Ornan says, don't you take it all for free. And David says, no, I'm not going to give, sacrifice your stuff to my God. I'm not going to sacrifice, I'm not going to make a sacrifice that costs me nothing. So he pays for everything. That's the story of Ornan the Jebusite. And that's where uh, that happened, and that's where Solomon built the temple. So all this stuff ha happens at Mount Moriah. The same place that Abram, Abraham took Isaac up to sacrifice him. What a coincidence all that is. Verse 3, it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning. Now let's stop there. Abraham rose early in the morning. Can you imagine ever a, a, a time that, a better time to sleep in than that day, Right? Can you imagine setting your alarm clock for early in the morning to go sacrifice your only son whom you love? He wakes up early in the morning. I mean, I don't like waking up early already, but to, to do that, what, what's going on there? It's, it seems strange. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Maybe, I mean, one theory is that he woke up early and he, was, he had so much faith in God that he said, okay, my son was promised, that the covenant promises was to come through my son, so maybe this is it. Maybe this is when the promise will be fulfilled and, and I'll sacrifice him, he'll come back, and all the families of the earth will be blessed. I don't know. But he did wake up early. took his son and the two uh, guys with him, two witnesses, arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then verse 4, it says, On the third day, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. I don't think it's any accident that it said it was on the third day. This is all pointing to Jesus. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So what were they? He says, we're going to go worship. I remember Doug Wilson pointing out, said, you know, a lot of people think of worship. One of my pet peeves, too, is, is people say, 
that the music, the ones who lead in music in churches are the worship leaders, right? Well, worship is not just the music. Worship is the whole thing. The whole service is worship. That's what we're doing. The whole liturgy is all worship. So uh, Doug Wilson said, they, Abraham didn't say, we're going to go worship, and then he took his guitars and, and his banjo, or his, uh, what's that shaky thing? <laughs> Tambourine, and, uh, and went and sang, sang some praise songs. It's obedience. It's sacrifice. That's worship. It's obeying God. So he said, we're going to go obey uh, and make a sacrifice, the hardest one he had to ever make. Verse 6, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Think about that. I laid it on Isaac, his son. Who else carried wood on the back of his shoulder and went up a mountain? Who else had wood, uh, a beam of wood on their back? to go up a mountain to be sacrificed. He laid the wood on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they went, both of them together. Now, this is one of the things we know is that Isaac, some of the little storybooks show a little boy, you know, like he's, he's probably late teenagers, maybe even as old as 20. I mean, he had to be strong. This had to be a lot of wood, for one thing, uh, enough wood to do a human sacrifice. So he lays all this wood on Isaac. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. He said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but there is, where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. You know, the wording there is they, they're, they're together. They're going up together. I think there's more to it than just saying they were walking together. They were united. They were, they were together in this thing. The fact that he lets his old dad bind him tells us that they were both together in this. He probably was a strong uh, 20-year-old or 19-year-old. And uh, anyways, they were together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham, I'm sure, said, I, I need to bind you up. I mean, just this story is kind of dark. I'm going to put you on the wood, put you on the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. I think it says that way for a reason. Slaughter his son. We're getting the emotions that Abraham's going through here in the language. But the angel of Yahweh called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. You can imagine, who, who do you think started cheering first, Abraham or Isaac? It's like, Dad, can you untie me now? <laughs> Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Again, no accident. There's a ram a, a, a substitute stuck in the thickets by his, thorn, by his horns. Thorns on his horns, right? Horn, or, uh, weeds and thorns are two things. They're part of the curse. God cursed the earth, and it grew thorns and thistles and weeds because of the curse. And then, of course, Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head when he took the curse on himself, the curse that we earned and merited, and then gave us instead his righteousness. So Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of Yahweh it shall be provided. You always wonder what uh, that night, what Abraham told his son when they were going to go on a road trip. Hey son, we're going to go on a trip together. There's, it doesn't say anything about what they thought or said or anything. It just kind of leaves it to our imagination. 
or text says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he, he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son. The reality is that Abraham didn't actually offer up his son, but the writer of Hebrews puts it in the perfect tense. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. So as far as Abraham was concerned, concerned his determination to obey meant that offering his son it was already done. It was as good as done. Maybe the reason he got up and left so early is he didn't want to tell Sarah. <laughs> Can you imagine? I'm going to take him and offer him up as a burnt offering. She says, no, you're not. I'm going to take you as a burnt offering. You complain about my meals being burnt. Hebrews eleven seventeen says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. One commentator put it something like this, When God called Abraham out of Ur, Abraham had to give up his past. But when he summoned him to Mount Moriah to deliver up his son, he was asked, to surrender his future as well. In both situations, Abraham obeyed right away without delay. We don't see delayed obedience in giving up his past, and we don't see delayed obedience in giving up his future. He wakes up early. He simply trusted in God's steadfast love, God's covenantal faithfulness to his promises. Abraham had faith in the promise of God because of God's unwavering reliability and trustworthiness. He knew and trusted in the faithfulness and trustworthiness of God, who always keeps his promises, who cannot break his word. Even when Abraham held a knife to the throat of his finally promised son, he trusted in the steadfast faithfulness of his God. How could Abraham's faith have been so strong that he was willing to follow the very command that seemed to nullify every promise that God had made up to that point. Our text tells us the answer to that in verse 19. He considered that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. We don't see this, we don't see in this story faith versus logic. It doesn't pit faith and logic or faith and reason against each other. Faith is not something we need when we don't have any reason to believe. Our text says he considered with reason. He, he reasoned. He, he, he used logic. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. He logically reasoned and went through a thinking process that God was able. Of course God could raise the dead. It says that in our text. That was his reasoning. It wasn't blind obedience, it was faith, and it was what he thought about. He put all the pieces that he knew about together, and he says, yeah, God could do this. He'd never seen anybody raised from the dead. He never had any testimonial evidence of it. But he knew God is omnipotent, and God is able, and God is not able to break his word. He's faithful to his promises. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. Now, we see a little hint of this in Genesis 22 as well, in verse 5, when it says, Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Right? He says, We'll come back. He believed that him and Isaac would both be coming back. In the Hebrew text, Abraham used the plural form of the Hebrew verb, we will return. We will return. He knew that God would keep his word. Now, he didn't ever see anybody be raised from the dead. But before Isaac was born, as far as having a son, Abraham's body was as good as dead. Sarah's body was as good as dead. So he saw a type of life out of death. God miraculously brought forth Isaac out of their two old dusty tombs. Abraham had already seen God can bring life out of death. 
So it shouldn't surprise us that he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. The fourth stanza of that old hymn, Trust and Obey, I think gives us an es the essence of faith, Abraham's faith and obedience in the sacrifice so well. It says, but we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. John MacArthur puts it this way, the proof of Abraham's faith was his willingness to give back to God everything he had, including the son of a promise, whom he had miraculously received because of his faith. After all the waiting and wondering, the son had been given by God. Then, before the son was grown, God asked for him back, and Abraham obeyed. Abraham knew that the covenant, which could only be fulfilled through Isaac, was unconditional. He knew, therefore, that God would do whatever was necessary, including raising Isaac from the dead, to keep his covenant. If Noah illustrates duration of faith, Abraham shows the depth of faith. That's MacArthur. God does this all the time. We've all experienced this. He does this. He likes to do this. He does this all the time. He puts us in hopeless circumstances in order to increase our hope in him. He puts us in hopeless circumstances in order to increase our hope in him. And then he says, always be ready to make a defense for anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you. He puts us in impossible situations in order to show us that with him, all things are possible. And then our text ends, verse, verse 19 ends by saying, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Figur figuratively speaking about what? Figuratively about the resurrection. He did receive him back. Just as Isaac had already been offered up, as far as Abraham was concerned, so now Isaac was as good as resurrected. Abraham did receive him back. Isaac was as good as dead, and God brings him back as a type of resurrection. The, the Greek word for figuratively speaking is parabole. It was a resurrection parable. Augustine said, Faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. Now all this, this whole story is to show us the Father's amazing love, his amazing grace for us in his willingness to give up his only begotten son. But he went through with it all the way. Romans 8, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I was just going to read a few of those verses, but every time I try that, I just have to read the whole thing. It's just so good. God didn't actually make Abraham do the deed, but in his own story, he actually spared not his own son and gave him up for us. Oh. What are you guys looking at? <laughs> we have a grandson on the loose. Um, now I don't know what I was saying. I, I think the story of Abraham and Isaac is so extreme, so intense, so awkward, so uncomfortable, so much like a horror story. And I think the reason is to show us the intensity 
and the extreme nature of what God did for us at Calvary. He had to show some way how horrible it was to give up his own son. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of God, haters of God, while we were enemies, he showed his love for us that he died for us in that state, us being his enemy, us being against him, us hiding, us running from God. He showed his love for us even in that case. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to close with this quote by Philip Hughes. He says, Abraham, however, as a man of faith, held tenaciously to the conviction that what appeared to him to be an insoluble problem was for God no problem at all. Though everything else was obscure, one thing was clear to him, namely that God, whose word was unshakably true, had a way of resolving the problem which was as yet unrevealed. Like the Apostle Paul in a later age, Abraham was assured that it is precisely the powerlessness of man which provides the opportunity for the triumphant manifestation of the omnipotence of God. It was on this certainty that he counted, taking into an account Taking into account the fact of God and his power and goodness, he considered, or better, he reckoned that God was able to raise men even from the dead. That is, that God was able to perform the greatest of all miracles if this was necessary for the preservation of his promise. That's Philip Hughes. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together. Our heavenly and merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, we use this time to receive our tithes and offerings. Our next song is 482, At the Lamb's High, uh, yeah, High 